So, so far, where have we gotten to? We, uh, we started summarizing what general equilibrium was. We saw that Irving Fisher of Yale reinvented general equilibrium in order to study finance. And we saw that just by reinterpreting the variables of general equilibrium, we could start to say a lot of things about finance. And in particular, we had the idea of free markets, an argument in favor of free markets. We had the idea of arbitrage and no arbitrage. So you could deduce a lot of prices without solving for the whole equilibrium, just by knowing what other prices are. And we, deduce, and we also learned that the price of many things is going to have to do with the utility and margin utilities of people. And that's going to have a lot to do with what their impatience is and whether they're rich people or poor people, who, you know, redistributions, redistributions of wealth. Who's got the money and how impatient the people who have the money are. So th those are the basic lessons that we're going to now carry into the course. And so for several lectures now, I'm going to leave the abstract theory of general equilibrium and start teaching you some of the basic uh, vocabulary of finance that you have to know and that everybody in finance knows, like what is a mortgage, what's an annuity, and stuff like that. So before I go there, though, I want to remind you of what Irving Fisher had done, so uh, of what Shakespeare had done 300 years before Irving Fisher. So Irving Fisher, remember, he, he cleared up the confusion of what interest was. He said, interest is crystallized impatience. It's not some horribly unjust thing. It's not, as Marx thought, exploitation. But, but uh, Shakespeare had discovered all this 300 years before. Now, when I was your age, and, or a little bit younger than you, in high school, we all had to read The Merchant of Venice. I have uh, two Indian co-authors and who are vaguely my age, maybe a little bit older, but anyway, they um, so grew up in India, and they had to learn The Merchant of Venice. And actually, they learned it a lot better than I did. They both have memorized The Merchant of Venice. They can recite almost the entire thing by heart. And, uh, but anyway, when I was in high school, it was completely typical to study The Merchant of Venice. I wonder how many of you have actually read it. Who's read The Merchant of Venice? OK, well, I mean, whoa, this is Yale. I'm, I'm shocked. OK, so a quarter of you have read it. Well, I recommend to the other three quarters that you do read it. Now, when it's taught nowadays, uh, especially at Yale, it's taught as a love story and a commentary on anti-Semitism. Now, of course, uh, it's both. It is a love story and a commentary on anti-Semitism. Shylock the lender is Jewish. And remember what we heard about the great religions. You know, they were all forbidding lending at interest, except for Judaism, which let let you le le loan money at interest to non-Jews. So Shakespeare, who's the money lender, is Jewish and lending it to Christians. And that plays a big role in the play um, and you know, what happens to them and you know, what people say about uh, Judaism is a big uh, element of the story. But the way the play is read now, that's the whole story. And I don't think it's the whole story. In fact, I think it's quite an unimportant part of the story. I think the heart of the story is Shakespeare's commentary on economics. And so I'm going to try and argue in the next 10 minutes that Shakespeare was not only a great writer, a great psychologist, but a great economist. And you're going to see that almost all the elements of the course are in this play, and that if you read it the way I think you should read it, it should be obvious that it's really about economics and not about love. So how do you know that? Well, the very first line of the play, Antonio walks in and he says, in sooth, I know not why I'm so sad. And there's an inter interlocutor, a minor character, whose name I've forgotten, Solario or something, says, well, it must be that you're so nervous, you know. You've got uh, all, your, all your riches are on, on, you know, on, on these boats, and they're, they're, they're at risk. And so anyone who had so much money at risk on boats would naturally be nervous and therefore maybe depressed. And Antonio says, no, 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 I'm not worried about the boats because every boat is on a different ocean. And so I'm not worried, you know, they're in a different ocean and they're, they're sailing at different times. I'm not worried about my boats. And so then the interlocutor says, well, then you must be worried about love. And he says, no, no, that's not it at all. So what do we see at the very beginning of the play? It's business first, love second. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, he understands diversification. OK, so <laughs> now, what is the plot of the play? Bassanio, 
who Harold Bloom, so it happens that I, I went to talk to Harold Bloom, I saw him in the Whitney Humanities Center, Yale's, one of Yale's greatest scholars, and among, you know, he's, he's sort of a polymath, he knows about everything, but including about Shakespeare, and he, he has a much advertised uh, photographic memory. So I happened to run into him at the Whitney Humanities Center, uh, actually in the men's room of the Whitney Humanities Center, and <laughs> uh, I asked, <laughs> While we were there, I asked him about uh, The Merchant of Venice and whether he happened to remember the rate of interest that uh, Shylock ends up charging Antonio. And he said, um, he said, dear boy, I remember almost everything, but that I'd forgotten. It was so unimportant to him that he didn't even remember the rate of interest. So, but he said, I happened to be lecturing about The Merchant of Venice in my class this afternoon. So I went and heard his lecture on The Merchant of Venice. So Bassanio, who's one of the heroes of the play, uh, according to Harold Bloom, is a complete loser. He's the one who needs the money to woo Portia, who's this beautiful uh, woman living uh, outside of Venice. And so he's got to borrow a huge amount of money. So he, when he enters, he's described as a Venetian, a scholar, and a soldier. Now, whenever Shakespeare says a this, a, you know, a scholar and a soldier, sometimes it's not a Venetian. When he says that, the guy's always a great guy. So this occurs repeatedly. In so anyway, Bassanio comes in as a star. He's a Venetian, a scholar, a soldier. What more can you want to be? And so he needs the money to war to woo Portia, and he's got a business plan to do it. He's tried wooing her before, you know, and it's got it's come to nothing, and he's lost his money. But he says, you know, if you shoot an arrow and you lose it, shoot an arrow again the same way, and then follow the second arrow more closely, and you'll figure out where the first arrow goes. So he's a man on a business venture with a business plan. So here's Bassanio, and here's uh, Shylock and Antonio. Now, he needs 3,000 ducats, and he, you know, he doesn't have any collateral or anything, and so he goes to Antonio, who's an older man, and uh, you know, according to Harold Bloom, there's some potential gay relationship, and you know, maybe they're lovers, and maybe they're not lovers, and you know, they're, that, that's half the lecture. Anyway, so <laughs> shy. So shy. Shylock lends the money, 3,000 ducats, and it's so much money he has to borrow it from another uh, money lender named Tubal, who's even richer than he is. Okay, so they argue over what the interest rate's got to be. And so Antonio says, uh, oh dear, I've forgotten to change, the, the, so this is out of order. So they argue over what the interest rate should be, and Antonio and uh, Shylock uh, make this argument. Antonio says, you know, it's uh, disgusting that you want to charge me interest. I mean, good Christians never charge interest. I'm appalled at you, you know? It's because you're Jewish, you're charging me interest. So he's, he's throwing epithets and insults at Shylock, but really he just wants a low interest rate. And so um, he says, Antonio says, Shylock, I would neither, neither borrow nor lend by taking or giving interest, but to supply the ripe wants of my friend, I'll break a custom. So ripe wants of my friend. That's saying because Bassanio was so impatient to get his hands on the money to find you know, Portia, she's going to get married if he doesn't hurry up and marry her himself, because of his impatience, he's willing to pay a high rate of interest. And Shylock says, you know, you're always complaining about me that I, that I uh, you know, charge interest and you're, you know, I've left out a whole bunch of stuff, but you know, I'm patient. You know, all of us are patient. That's the badge of our tribe. We're patient. And so that's why I'm willing to lend you the money. So here Shakespeare has laid out, and it goes over five patience, pages, patience and impatience. Okay, so, in the, uh, so then they get in an argument again about interest, and, and um, uh, uh, okay, so I forgot a slide. So the argument is, Antonio tells, uh, Shylock tells a story. He says, you know, even in the Bible, you say that it's unchristian, uh, to lend it interest. But don't you know the story in the Bible where, J where Jacob was asked to do, perform a service in the field using his fields. Uh, somebody wanted to use his fields for a while. And so Jacob said, okay, you can use my fields, but I have to charge you a fee. And the fee is going to be that however spotted lamb, many spotted lambs are born, those are the ones that I get. And so it turned out that there was a huge number of spotted lambs. And so um, although Jacob had lent some of his sheep and his fields to, to the person who wanted them, he got back vastly more than he lent at the beginning. And so Antonio answers, well, this isn't interest. 
this is, uh, you know, this is a risk. Jacob got so much more because he took a risk. Who would have known how many lambs were going to be born? And so it's you don't really charge interest, you're just uh, you're an investor. So they haggle over this for a while and they come to the conclusion that uh, he's going to lend the money. And so what is the interest that they actually end up charging, the thing that uh, Harold Bloom couldn't remember? Well, zero. Okay, I'll lend you the money and take no dwat of usance for my monies. Not a single interest for my money. But they have to negotiate something else, something uh, besides the rate of interest. They have to negotiate the collateral. And so they said, so they say, you know, go with me, blah, 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 and then uh, let the forfeit be nominated. If you don't pay, let the forfeit be an equal pound of your fair flesh to be cut off and taken in what part of your body pleaseth me. Now, the other half of the, there were two lectures by Harold Bloom. Half, the second half of the first lecture was what part of the body is he really talking about? And there seemed to be only two, two possibilities, but uh, so the heart and another possibility. And Harold Bloom favored the second possibility. But anyway, it's collateral that they're putting up for the loan. So, um, okay, so there's collateral. So now what happens, so what we found is that Shakespeare has understood the impatience theory of interest. You've got an impatient borrower and a patient lender, and it's the trade-off between patience and impatience which is going to decide what the rate of interest is. So that's already Irving Fisher's biggest message. And then the second thing he's noticed, which Irving Fisher didn't notice at all, is that, and, and this is going to be a large part of the rest of the course, how do we know these people are going to keep their promises? Why is Antonio going to keep his promises? Well, it's because he's putting up collateral. And Antonio is stepping in for Bassanio uh, because uh, his collateral is worth more than Bassanio's. You know, Shylock wants his pound of flesh, not Bassanio's pound of flesh. So, uh, all right, so that's the, that's the beginning, by the way, just how does the play unfold? It gets more interesting. So what happens is after getting his money, uh, Bassanio then goes to woo, woo fair Portia. And how does he woo her? Well, it turns out the way that her fabulously wealthy father has set up the marriage is there are three caskets, a gold one, a silver one, and a lead one. And he has to pick one. And one of them contains her picture. And if you get the one with her picture, you get to marry her. If you pick the wrong one, and here's the shocking thing, if you get the wrong one, you swear before you choose, if you choose wrong, never to speak to lady afterward in way of marriage. So not only don't you get Portia, you don't get anybody. So what is the purpose of this absurd uh, contract? Well, the purpose is maybe to make sure that people really want to marry her. Maybe the father set it up so that only someone who really wanted to marry her would bother to enter this uh, competition because the risk is so high. But another way of saying it is it gives an excuse to Shakespeare to talk about risk and return and how, you know, people who have a higher risk are going to expect a higher return. And Morocco, you know, so, that's, so they talk about risk and return. And Aragon basically says she's really not you know, she's not that good looking to justify such a high risk. But anyway, but all those other guys pick the wrong casket and Bassanio picks the lead one and uh, gets her. And so, uh, so she becomes the wife. Now, of course, she's delighted by this. He's, she's the one, uh, he's the one she wanted all along. And so she says, uh, let me give you this ring. And, uh, you know, this is a, yet a third contract. The first contract is the loan of Shylock. The second contract is the, is the, 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 the choosing the caskets and, you know, a contract that you won't marry again if you choose wrong. And now we have a third contract, which is Portia deciding that um, she gives a ring to Bassanio and, sees, and she says, let this ring represent your love. And he says, when this ring parts from this finger, then parts life from hence. I'll never lose this ring. I'll never give it up. I love you so much. So, of course, the boats appear to sink, you know, calamity appears, my ships have all miscredited, you know, um, Shylock wants his collateral. So Portia uh, now, who turns out to be incredibly wealthy, so we realize, again, the play's not about love, she's beautiful, but she's fabulously rich, much richer than Shylock is, much richer than Tuval was. They had to scrounge around to get the 3,000 ducats. She hands 6,000 ducats, and then 12,000 ducats, then 36,000 ducats, says, look, you know, offer Shylock all this money, you know, tell him, here, I've got the money, tell him not to take his pound of flesh. So uh, they hold a trial to decide whether Shylock should get his pound of flesh or not. And so Shylock, by this time, is incredibly pissed off at, uh, 
to say the least, at Antonio and Bassanio. And why is he so angry? Because, among other things, his daughter Jessica has run off with a Christian named Lorenzo and stolen his money. And so he yells, my daughter, my ducats. And so she sells his, uh, she sold his, his wife's ring who, um, for, for a monkey. And he said, or his ring that was given to him by his wife Leah. And he says, I had it of Leah when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. So Shylock believes in keeping his promise. He would never have broken a promise. He never would have given away the ring that was given to him by his wife. He absolutely wouldn't do it. He believes in keeping promises. Unlike everybody else in the play, his daughter, you know, everybody, as we'll see. So, um, so another Lancelot says, this making of Christians will raise the price of hogs. This, this Jewish girl Jessica has become a Christian, so now she's going to be able to eat pork, so it's going to increase the demand for pork and therefore raise the price of hogs. So Shakespeare, the play is full of economics. It's all about teaching economics. Okay, so, and, so anyway, they, they, they go to the trial and uh, Shylock thinks the guy's a complete fool. He doesn't understand interest. He doesn't understand the whole point of a marriage contract. I mean, not of a marriage contract, of a lending contract and, and getting interest. And basically he says, I gotta skip over this a little quickly. He says, you know, I've, we've got a contract. Your city, the greatest uh, uh, commercial city in the world at that time, can't possibly survive if you don't uphold contracts. So if you deny me, fie upon your law, there is no force in the decrees of Venice, I stand for judgment. I stand for keeping promises, and the law is supposed to enforce promises. I stand for law, is what Shylock says. Now, the, at the trial, who turns out to be the judge? Well, Portia has disguised herself as the judge, and she's actually the judge. And so she comes in and she has this famous line, who is the merchant here and which is the Jew? So again, this confirms to me it's about economics. If it was about Judaism, it would be who's the Christian and who's the Jew? She's saying who's the borrower and who's the lender? That's how she comes in. And so then she says, you've got to show mercy. And this is the most famous line in the play, the quality of mercy, blah, blah, you all remember it, who's seen it? And uh, he says, um, and, then, and then Bassanio says, look, I've got 6,000 ducats. I've got more than that. Take that. And he says, you know, a contract is a contract. You've humiliated me. All kinds of humiliations have happened to me. I've got feelings too. I've been humiliated. I want the contract. And the contract says that I should get the pound of flesh. And so Bassanio says, you know, to do a great right, do a little wrong. Okay, so, you know, def you know let him default. And so, uh, so what does Portia say? What is the judgment? It sounds, she, she has to play the judge. It seems like the whole city depends on enforcing contracts. And here it seems like a horrible thing to do. You're going to have to kill somebody. So what judgment can she possibly, possibly make? She says, well, the state has to enforce contracts, of course. Contracts have to be enforced. But only good contracts should be enforced. And so what's wrong with the contract? Does she say we're going to reduce what you owe from 3,000 to, you know, 1,500? Does she, you know, that's principal forgiveness. Does she say, uh, does she say you don't have to, you know, what does she say? What she says is that what was wrong is the contract wasn't right. The it wasn't the interest rate that was wrong. It wasn't the amount you owe that was wrong. It was the collateral that was wrong. So she says the right collateral was uh, a pound of flesh but not a drop of blood. And so the state intervenes not to change the interest rate, not to change the principal, but to change the collateral. Okay, so, um, all right, so that, that's going to turn out to be, you know, the leverage was wrong. And so the second, th okay, so then the play ends um, with Bassanio asking the judge, he's so pleased that things have turned out right, if he can reward the judge. He doesn't know who the judge is. And he says, you know, I've got all these ducats that uh, I've just gotten. You know, why don't I give you some of the ducats? And the judge says, well, uh, no, I don't want the ducats, but I notice you've got this ring on your finger. Why don't you give me that? And, uh, you know, he says, well, I can't do that. My Porsches, I've promised. And, and the judge says, well, you know, um, give it to me anyway. And he gives her the ring. And so the play uh, finally ends with her revealing herself, and he's incredibly embarrassed that he's given her the ring. So this is another contract broken, another default. And, he, and then uh, he says, but I'm never going to default again. And Antonio steps in and says, you know, I'll guarantee again that he'll never default again. <laughs> and of course, we all know that he's going to default. Okay, so the whole play is just about 
contracts and breaking contracts and figuring. So at first it's about what the rate of interest should be, then it switches to should contracts always be enforced. And yes, they should be enforced, but the enforcement should be the taking of collateral and sometimes the amount of collateral put up is wrong. So that's going to be the conclusion of this course, that what went wrong in the last uh, two years or three years was a horrible mistake about how much collateral could be put up. And the Fed, instead of just monitoring the interest rate, which is what you're taught in macroeconomics is supposed to do, should be monitoring uh, collateral as well, and maybe even most importantly. So I'm now, okay, so with that, introduction to the rest of the course. Uh, I don't know how convinced you are about Shakespeare the Economist, but anyway, let's now switch to um, learning some, some of the basic words of finance. So, okay, so, so I'm going to now follow pretty closely what the notes are. Uh, all right, so let's imagine a world where we've solved for the equilibrium this could be the, you know, the real world or in one of our models. And there are many time periods, not just two time periods. So let's suppose that there, as there are, as we're going to see in great detail later, suppose it's possible to pay money today in order to get a dollar next year, or pay some amount of money today in order to get a dollar in two years, or pay a different amount of money today to get a dollar in three years. So pi t is the amount of money you pay today to get a dollar at time t. That's called a zero because there's no coupon, you just get something at the end. And so though you'll, we'll see uh, next class, you know, we're going to start talking about real, real markets and what the prices of all those zeros are. So anyway, that pi t is something that is traded in the market and everybody at every hedge fund and every Wall Street bank knows what pi t is at the beginning of each day. Now, Fisher said, well, don't get too lost thinking about pi t, think about pt, you know, take out inflation you, know, you have to make an expectation about what inflation is, but assuming you're right, you can figure out from these pi t's what pt is, the present value price, how much would you pay today in goods to get an apple at time t, not a dollar at time t, but an apple at time t. So it involves knowing what inflation is and what the price of apples is going to be at time, time t. So Fisher said, there's a lot of stuff you can do with the pi t's, there's also more important stuff you can do with the pt's, and you should always keep those in mind. Okay, so um, let's take the simplest case where pi t is a constant interest rate. There's a constant interest rate i. So if you ask, um, what's a dollar worth today in terms of how many dollars you can get next year, it's 1 plus i. What's a dollar worth today in two years is 1 plus i squared. So putting it backwards, a dollar in two years the price of it today must be 1 over 1 plus i squared. So a dollar in t years, the value today is 1 plus i over t. So this is just a simplification. So, so we'll see that lots of the jargon of economics assumes that there's this constant interest rate uh, that's, that's determining all these prices. Okay, so the first thing to realize is what Fisher calls the present value price. If there were some asset that paid off money in the future, m1 through mt, you don't have to solve the whole equilibrium to figure out what its price ha would be if you knew the prices of these zeros, pi 1 through pi t, because to get m2 dollars at time 2 just costs you pi 2 dollars today. So you add up the cost of buying all the cash flows of the asset, that has to be the price of the asset today. And if the prices of the zeros are given just by the interest rate, discounting it, then, uh, then it's just m1 over 1 plus i, m2 over 1 plus i squared, and mt over 1 plus i to the t. I see there's a typo here. Oh, no. No, there's no typo. It's 1 plus i to the t. There are all these 1 plus i to the t. Okay. So, and now, if the price weren't that, if the price of this bond were, were bigger, were, let's say, smaller than this, uh, what would you do? You would buy the bond, and at the same time, you'd sell promises to deliver M1, M2, and MT in the future. If you sold those promises and nobody doubted that you would keep your promise, so this is something you know, Shakespeare wouldn't have, would have been suspicious of, but if you made those promises and, and no one doubted you'd keep them, you could raise this much money by selling all the promises. So you get this much money, and if the bond costs less than that, you could make all the promises, get all the money, buy the bond, have money left over, 
Okay, then you'd have to keep all your promises. But the bond itself would be paying you money in the future that you could use to keep all your promises. So it has to be that this is the price of the bond, provided that everybody will allow you to borrow and lend at those rates of interest. Because if it weren't, you would either buy the bond and sell all the promises, or in the other case where the price is higher, you'd sell the bond, okay, get all this money, and then um, buy all the, use that money to buy all those promises. Okay, and then you could keep the promise, then you could keep, the, then you could make the payments of the bond because the promises would come due to you. So if you, in that case, you'd have to believe people who made promises to you. So as long as nobody's doubting the other people keeping their promises, it has to be that by no arbitrage, the price of a bond is just the discounted cash flows. That was Fisher's main principle. Okay, so we saw that last time. We're just going to do it. Uh, okay, so we're now going to introduce a few vocabulary. So the first thing is the doubling rule. So I think mo mo at least half of you probably know this, but you know, it's uh, much better if you can do things in your head than having to calculate them all. So the doubling rule says how many years at I percent interest does it take to double your money? So, um, so you can just solve this. Okay, so one plus I to the N means that you know, if you take the logs of both sides and you know that log of 2 is 0.69, then, uh, then, then you know, you take the log of both sides and log 1 plus i has to be log of 2, so n equals 0.69 over log of 1 plus i. Okay, and so now log of 1 plus i, you know, is approximately i. Why is that? So this is Taylor's rule. You don't actually have to know this if you've never seen Taylor's rule before, but you know, an approximation of log of 1 plus i, you know, for any function f of x, it's f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus 1 half f double prime of a times x minus a squared. That's the standard Taylor's rule thing. So therefore, log of 1 plus i is, you know, log of 1 is 0. So it's going to be 0 plus i, because the derivative of the log is 1 over x, and at x equals 1, that's 1 over 1. So it's 0 plus i, and then the second derivative is minus 1 over x squared, and at x equals 1, that's minus 1. So with the half here, the approximate log 1 plus i is approximately 0 plus i minus i squared over 2. So you can replace log of 1 plus i with, I mean 0.69 over log of 1 plus i with 0.69 over i minus i squared over 2. So you know, for very small interest rates, I squared is practically nothing. So 0.69 over I, you know, if the interest rate is 0.023%, uh, is, uh, 0 0.023, that times and 0.69 divided by 0.023 is 30. So it says that in, at 2.3% interest, you double your money in 30 years. Well, if I is... 7%, say, then, then i squared is starting to get a little bit bigger. So i minus i squared over 2 is 0.07, i squared 0 0.0049 over 2, that's 0 0.0675. So if I put in i equals 0.07, it's 0 0.69 over 0 0.0675. That's around like 69 over 67. You know, there's a decimal thing. So it's a little over 10, say 10.2. That's like 0 0.72 over 0 0.07. So that's 0.72 is the doubling rule. To get for interest rates around 7% or 6% or 4%, something like that, you know, you're going to divide not into 69 but into 72. So 72, you know, the interest rate is 0.07, right? Interest rate is a percent, so it's, it's a decimal thing. So, so 0.07 or 0.06 is like 72 over 6. So at 6%, it takes 12 years to double your money. So the rule, the basic rule is, if you want to know how long it takes at 6% interest to double your money, you just take 72 divided by 6, and it's 12 years. If it's 8% interest, 72 over 8 is about 9 years. If it's 10% uh, you know, interest, it's a little over 7 years to double your money. Okay, and so that rule is incredibly useful to keep in your head because you can do all, you can shock and amaze people by how fast you can compute things that you know, if you just remember that rule. So let's just check the rule, by the way. Um, so suppose that you have uh, $24 in the bank, 
Okay, and you have 6% interest. So here I took the $24. You look at the top, you see that's the B1 number. And I've just multiplied it by the interest rate, 1.06. Okay, and so I keep doing that. You know, here I've multiplied the thing above it by 1.06 again. So I keep investing the money at 6% interest. And over here I've invested the money at 7% interest. Okay, so anyway, after 12 years, you see that $24, you know, this is year one. So at year 12, $24 has become 48. So it's a very good approximation. And so 7%, you know, it's supposed to take a little over 10 years. So 10 years, you're not quite there, but 11 years, you're past it. So you can see how, we're starting with 24, you can see how good the doubling rule is. Okay, so that's just something to keep, so we can now do in class lots of concrete examples without having to take out our calculators and stuff because we can do them in class, in your head. All right, so that's, so let's just do that now. Um, okay, so in fact, why did I pick $24? Well, this is a famous story you hear in second grade, the Indians, uh, sold Manhattan for $24 in 1646. So how bad a deal was that for the Indians? It looks incredibly stupid, but actually, you know, interest accumulates pretty fast. So if you look at 6% interest, okay, so 360 years gets you to 2006, that's a sort of round number, at 6%, so at 6%, how long does it take to double? It takes 12 years to double. So that means at 6% interest, you're doubling every 12 years. So in 360 years, you're going to double 30 times. So in your head, you can figure out that doubling uh, every 30 times, you know, doubling 30 times is 2 to the 30th. And of course, 2 to the 10th is something you should know. It's 1,024. You know, so, so I'm sure you know that number, right? Two to the, okay, so it's one, th anyway, that's a good one to remember. Two to the tenth is about a thousand, so a thousand cubed is about a billion. So basically, 24 becomes 24 billion. So at 6% interest, they sold Manhattan for 24 billion in today's dollars. So that's, that's pitifully low, but if you look at 7% interest, you can do the same calculation. So at 7% interest, you should do this in your head now. So it's going to double every 72 over seven years. So there are 360 years about, 360 is a very round number. So three, 360 divided by 72 over seven, that's five times seven, it's 35. So two to the 35th, well it's like a billion times two to the fifth, which is 32. So it's a one dollar becomes 32 billion, but we started with 24 dollars, so it's 768 billion. So now you're starting to get a little bit closer to what um, the value of Manhattan is. I mean, the value of all the real estate in the country, all the houses in the country, used to be 20 trillion. I'm not sure how far they've gone down now. Let's say they're 15 trillion. Um, so 15 trillion, you add commercial real estate, you know, maybe in the whole country that's worth 25 trillion, or, you know, 20, but that went down too. So let's say 20 trillion. Now, how much of the 20 trillion could possibly be in New York City? I've actually got no idea. But it can't be that much more, you know, the whole country is 20 trillion. New York can't be worth much more than one or two trillion of the 20 trillion. So, you know, you're not that far off. So the deal's not that spectacularly bad, although it sounds ridiculous. Anyway, the point is you can do this in your head, and we can, uh, okay. So now the next thing that you realize in this example is how huge a difference a percent makes. So why is that so important? Well, managers, hedge funds, we all charge a percent interest. So look at what's happening. I mean, if you look at our Indian, you know, investment of 24, and you look, I don't know how many years you want to look over, but you can look over, you know, 36 years, that's a sort of typical, you're young, making an investment. When you get old, what's the, um, you know, what's the, What's the difference? This was, six, this was the 6% growth, and this was the 7% growth. This is the difference, and this is the, I guess, the percentage difference. So it's 28%. Uh, of course, I didn't label these, but... Uh, uh, 
Yeah, so this is, the, this, is the, this is the difference and this is the percent difference. So the percent difference, it, okay, so that well, I just showed it to you. Over 36 years, it's 28.6% um, difference. So a typical, you know, you're putting money away right now. You might be giving it to some fund. You might be investing it in your, you know, your, you know whatever fund you're investing in, it, they could be charging 1% interest. And it seems, what's 1%? It's a tiny amount, 1%, you know? But over 30 years, they're taking 28% of your money, 36 years. For, with the Indians, over 360 years, we saw that it was an astronomical amount that they took. They took almost all your money, right? So, I mean, look at the percentage that got uh, taken. So 768 billion versus um, uh, versus 24 billion. I mean, what could be? I mean, it's astounding. Okay, so giving one percent away to a money manager is giving away a fortune if you think you're going to stick with the money manager for a reasonable amount of time. So if you want the secret to how hedge funds make money, that's the first way they make it, the most important way. They charge a fee that sounds small, but it adds up over a few years and it amounts to a huge amount of money. Now, you can make it much smaller. Why does it amount to so much money? Because the money that you put in the fund, you're keeping in the fund. So it's growing and growing and growing. So they're taking 1% of your $124 today. That sounds like nothing. But the money's still there, and now 40 years later, they're taking 1% of a much bigger number. That's why the number gets to be so large. Okay, so that's the second thing. All right, so now let's keep going. That's the, so that's the basic uh, thing. So now let's go to define a few terms that everybody should know. What's a coupon bond? A coupon bond is the simplest kind of bond, the first one that was created, and it pays a fixed coupon, dollars, every period, for T periods, the T is called the maturity. So it's defined by the coupon, which is the fixed payment it makes every year until period T, which is the maturity of the bond. And then it also, at the end of period T, pays a principal, okay, which is, um, so here, which is usually how the bond is uh, denominated, um, the face value of the bond. It pays the principal or face value. So typical, that's usually 100 or 1,000. So a coupon might be uh, 666. Six, a hundred six. Okay, that would be a six percent coupon bond. You know, you can also define the coupon by the percentage of the of the face that it pays every year as a coupon. So little c is the percentage. So 0.06 uh, times 100 is six 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 six. I could use b. You know, big C is six dollars. Okay, so it's defined by its percentage, by the face, and by the maturity. So the first obvious thing to say is if the interest rate is 6%, and the bond is paying a 6% coupon, then it has to be worth its face. So let's always assume the face is 100. So why is that? Because if, uh, okay, so why is that? It doesn't seem totally obvious because you know you're, the formula is you take 100 times C, that's the first payment, divided by 1 plus I, then 100 times C divided by 1 plus I squared, et cetera. It's not so obvious that's gonna turn out to be equal to 100. But so you just have to think for a second why that should be. And the way to think of this is if you had $100 in the bank at 6% interest, you could get $106 the next year, take the six and throw and spend it. You'd still have $100 in the bank. That would give you $6 again the next year. You could take that $6 and spend it. You'd still have $100 in the bank. You keep doing that until the last year when you've got $106. So at 6% interest, putting the money in the bank and spending the coupons would give you exactly the same cash flow as the bond's giving you. So therefore, uh, whether you put the money at the bank at 6% interest or, keep or, or, or buy the bond, you're getting the same cash flow. So it has to be, by no arbitrage, that the initial outlay was the same. So it has to be $100. Okay, well that, obvious. Okay, now you can prove it many different ways. Now you could also imagine keeping a bond forever paying 6% interest, then you get, if $100 at 6% interest would give you $6 forever. So if there was 6% interest and you were getting $12 forever, how much would that be worth? At 6% interest, $12 forever. 6% interest, you get $12 every year forever, what's that? How many dollars is that worth originally? If the interest rate that all banks are giving and the whole world's agreeing 6% is the rate of interest and someone's offering to give you $12 every year forever, how much money in present value terms is he giving you? 200. 
right? Because 200 at 6% would give you $12 every year. Okay, so these are the most basic uh, formulas to keep in mind. Okay, so those, you know, you may be hearing these things for the first time, so it, it takes a second to adjust to it, but there's no cleverness involved in figuring these out. Now, what's, so we've got, we've got the doubling rule, we've got uh, coupon bonds, and now, so that's simple. Now, somewhat subtler thing is an annuity. Okay, so an annuity pays you a fixed amount for a fixed number of years. So it doesn't pay the principal at the end. So it pays that C, it's supposed to be a capital C, it pays C, 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 C for a fixed number of years. So it's a T period annuity. Now, annuities also <coughs> can be changed in two important ways. They can be indexed to inflation. That's a much better annuity because now you're, 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 inf you know, you're protected against inflation. It also could be time to last the rest of your life. So we're going to come to this when we talk about Social Security. The most important annuity by far in the whole economy is the Social Security annuity. Once you retire and you're in Social Security, they figure out what your, co what your coupon is going to be every year. It's, I'll tell you the formula in a couple classes. So depending on how much you've contributed, they calculate what your coupon is every year. And so from the day you turn 65, for the rest of your life, you get the same C, inflation corrected. So we're going to have to talk about why they decided on that contract. But anyway, that's an annuity. So it depends on the length of life. Okay, so you know, these annuities are famous in history. Jane Austen, in Sense and Sensibility, said it was a disaster, you know, because Whenever you give someone an annuity, they live forever. And she said that, you know, some character says her mother gave the servants in the houses uh, annuities after their, you know, their husbands died. And uh, she figured that they were so old. No, she gave the annuities. They were the servants of her mother's. And she gave them the annuity after their husbands died. And, uh, you know, since they were so old, she figured if she'd pay them a few years, and that'd be the end of it. And they just went on and on and on and on. And it was just, you know, she got tired of giving them all the money. But anyway, so obviously when you're giving a life annuity, you have to calculate how long the person's going to live. And so we're going to come back to that, the selection of, you know, who takes annuities. Do they know that they're going to live longer or not? Anyway, that market's all screwed up, and we're going to come to that later. But it's a famous market, the annuity market. Now, how can you figure out the value of an annuity? Okay, so this is a very simple thing to do uh, once you've once you've come this far. So this is the next thing to remember. So remember, an annuity is paying C, 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 C up to period T. Here are the periods T. Okay, so how much should this be worth? The present value. What is the present value today at time zero? Well, we know that if it actually went forever, C, C, like that, it would be forever, it would go C over the interest rate, I. Annuities are often inflation corrected, so I wrote R for the real rate of interest. So you could call it C over R for the real rate of interest, whatever. Let's say it's nominal. Let's keep to I, even though I haven't used that notation there. So C over I, if you get C dollars forever, it's called a perpetuity. So perpetuity, we already know how to value. Okay, we said C over I, right? It's 6%. If you're getting $12 every year, it's worth $200. Now, what if it gets cut off at T? Sounds like there's going to be a very complicated formula to calculate. But actually, it's a very simple formula. Okay, why is that? Because the T period, so there, here's the perpetuity, and the T period annuity equals the perpetuity minus a per perpetuity starting at time t, minus perpetuity uh, uh, contracted at time t. Right? So why, why is that? Here we have a perpetuity. At time zero, you say to someone, I'll, you know, the state, the government says, we'll pay you and your descendants C dollars forever. Okay, now you can, so we know what that's worth, C over I. Now we say, suppose the state tells you, we're going to pay you C until time T. What's that worth? Well, it's worth this, the whole thing, minus this part of it. But 
looked at from this point of view here, the whole part of it is just a perpetuity again. So it's just the perpetuity, which is C over I, minus C over I, another perpetuity here, but as of time t, because that's, you know, that's like the zero time, the money's coming the next period forever, just like at time zero, the money came starting at period one forever, so at time t, starting f one period later forever, so therefore it's this divided by one plus i to the t. Okay, so it's just c over i times one minus one over one plus i to the t. So this is the next thing you have to memorize unfortunately, but there are only a few things you have to memorize. So this is a very famous formula for the value of an annuity. Okay, so how do you, uh, okay, so let's just do an example. Suppose somebody, maybe I can just do the same examples. Okay, so you, you got the proof of that, right? This is no surprise. Okay, remember the whole perpetuity is obviously at 6%. I mean, let's just think of something at 6%. So let's do the 6% annuity. At 6%, it's worth 6% uh, perpetuity, $6, uh, sorry, six, um, what am I saying? A, uh, at 6% interest, 6% interest, a $12 perpetuity is worth $200. That's what we said before. Okay, so what is a 36 year? Okay, so at 6% interest, $12 perpetuity is worth $200. So at 6% interest, what is a $12 30 year? year annuity worth? Is worth what? So you, how much is that worth? Okay, so if it went on forever, it would be worth $200. If we cut it off after 30 years, 30 years is a bad time to cut it off. Let's cut it off after, um, let's cut it off after 24 years. Okay, so if you have 6% interest, you get $12, not for every year in the future, but for 24 years, how much is it worth? Well, it can't be worth $200 because it would be worth $200 if it went forever. So it's worth less than $200, but how much less? So my uncle died, left my sister an annuity. She just had no idea what the annuity was, uh, was worth. So do you have any idea what it's worth? <laughs> yep. Okay, it is, and how did you get that? Yep. Yep. So it's one minus a quarter, so that's three quarters, and three quarters times the 200 we got before is 150. Exactly, exactly right what he said. So does everybody get that? So let's say we have, uh, let's try another one. Okay, so let's suppose I tell you, um, So let's suppose I pay eight dollars. See how long is this going to be? Okay. Suppose let's do, let's make the okay. Let me say that again, just in case uh, you didn't follow that, because I'm going to give a slightly harder one this time. So he's saying, how do you figure out the value of an annuity? Something by next class you'll be able to do in your head. It's going to be. Take the cash flow that you get every year. If it went on forever, it would be so easy to figure out what the value was. If it's $12 at 6% interest, that's like having $200 in the bank, because then you get at 6% interest, you're going to get $12 every year forever. Okay, so we know that $12 a year forever is clearly $200. That's C over I, 12 over 
It's $200. But it's going to get cut off in year 24. So we're going to lose all this future stuff. But the future is not worth very much. Why isn't it worth, worth very much? Because, you know, by the time we get here, we've already discounted by a lot. So a dollar starting here is actually only a quarter of a dollar starting back here. Because in 24 years at 6% interest, you've doubled twice. So it's worth a quarter. So you just take a quarter of the same annuity. So it's one minus, it's, it's a one minus a quarter of the same annuity. So the one that ends in 24 years is like three quarters of the value of the perpetuity. Three quarters of 200 is 150. Okay, that's how we did it. So let's just try a slightly, let's reverse the thing. Suppose we know the pro present value is 100. Suppose we know the present value is 100. You're now the company. And you're trying to figure out how much to pay. Okay, so what is the C going to be? Let's say it's 8% interest. Okay, and just to, I'll just do the same example in the notes. Okay, and 30 years is a typical thing, so it's not going to work out exactly evenly. So 8% interest for 30 years. Okay, so we know it's worth 100. All right, so let's get rid of all the irrelevant stuff so you don't have the board cluttered. We've got something that's worth 100. There's the formula down here. So the thing is worth 100. You know the interest rate is 8% now, and it's a 30-year annuity. So if somebody tells you the interest rate's 8% these days, you're going to get a 30-year annuity. You've got $100 to invest. You go to the annuities company, the insurance company, you tell them, I want an annuity. How much should they give you every year? Well, you just have to figure out what C is. So you put C over 0.08. Okay, so what does that tell you? What would that be if it was a, what would they be paying you if it was a perpetuity? They'd be, they'd be paying you, if it was a perpetuity, what would they be paying you? They'd be paying $8 a year, right? So, but they're only going to pay you for 30, for 30 years. So how much are they going to pay you? 1 plus i to the t. Okay, so this is 1.08, 1.08 to the 30th. And what's 1.08 to the 30th? Well, 1.08 to the 30th, by our rule, is what? It's equal to 1.08 to the 27th. Okay, in, in nine years at 8% interest, it'll double. So after 27 years, it's going to double three times. 1.08 to the third power. So after 27 years, it's going to double three times. So that's eight, right? Two to the third power is eight. And then at 8% over three years, it goes eight goes to 108, goes to about 116, goes to about 124. But you know, it's going to grow a little faster because you know 1.08 times 1.08 is a little bit more than 1.16. So it's going to grow to like 1.25 instead of 1.24, so that's 10. Okay, so this is just 1 over 10. So the whole thing is 9 tenths. So basically, uh, you get almost all the value. After 30, after 30 years, at 8% interest, it's such a high interest rate that after 30 years, you're getting 9 tenths of the value of the annuity. Okay, so you're going to have to get paid 10 ninths the uh, you know, $8,000. It would have been $8,000 if it were perpetuity. You have to pay the guy a little bit more. You have to get a little bit more because you're only getting it for 30 years. But because the interest rate's so high, the stuff after 30 years isn't very important. It's only, uh, you know, you have to be given an extra tenth. So it's 10 ninths times 8,000. So it's 8,888 is what your annuity is going to be every year. Okay, so just to summarize it, to say it all again, we know how to compute perpetuities with ease. And so if you want $100 and a coupon forever, and the interest rate's 8%, that's just 8,000 forever. If you only get it for a shorter amount of time, obviously you have to get more. How much more? Well, it depends each year for only 30 years. It depends on how much you're giving up at the end. And at 8%, you're only giving up a tenth of the whole value. So you have to be compensated for that each year by getting 10 you know, ninths of what you would have gotten before. So we're up to 8,888. Okay, all right, so that's, 
Okay, so th those are, all right, so those are the words that everybody has to know. So now let's just do um, a couple more simple computations here, uh, just to give you an idea of how Fisher helped here. Okay, so I'm going to do a few mortgage things. I'm going to do a few, I haven't defined mortgage yet, do I? Why didn't I do that? Um, so a mortgage is just a 30-year annuity. A mortgage, so one more thing, a mortgage is an annuity, a fixed mortgage. Okay, a fixed mortgage, a fixed rate mortgage. Mortgage uh, is defined by uh, a principal. Okay, so we're going to, when we talk about the crisis, this word principal will come up all the time, so that's the face value. The principal, a mortgage coupon rate, coupon rate, and uh, a principal mortgage coupon rate and a maturity. So the most common, this is a fixed rate mortgage, so the most common kind of maturity is 30 years. 30 years is the most common, and then sometimes they're 15 year mortgages, and then there's a whole host of other mortgages we're going to come to later where there's floating interest rates. So the 30 year mortgage, how much do you have to pay? Well, there's one, you know, if it were on an annual payment and it were an 8% mortgage for 30 years on $100,000, so if it was a $100,000 principal at 8% coupon, okay, uh, for 30 years, we just calculated that you would have to pay, the payment would be $8,888 a year because $8,888 a year discounted at 8% is going to give you $100,000. Okay, so that's how the mortgage works. Once they've told you that, so whenever you hear about a mortgage, you always hear the mortgage rate. That's the coupon rate. Okay, the, the maturity is usually 30 years. You know, then you'd have to be told how much the mortgage is for. Then you can figure out what does the guy have to pay every year, and it's, you know, you just figure out the annuity payment that at this interest rate makes his payments have present value at this interest rate equal to the principal. So he just saw his 8,888 a year. And there's one more little twist with mortgages. Okay, so that's not literally true what I said. Mortgages have monthly payments. Monthly payments. Okay, monthly payments. They're monthly payments, uh, and so the monthly rate at monthly rate equal the coupon divided by 12. So if it's an 8% mortgage, then it means that they're, they're taking two-thirds. So in this case, we'd have 8% over 12, which equals two-thirds of a percent. Okay, so the mortgage would be, you know, 0.67%. Okay, and so then you do the monthly calculations. You have to figure out the C, such as summation, over 1 plus 2 thirds percent, so that's 1.067, in other words, 1.067 to the T, T equals 1 to 360, has to equal 100,000. That's how much you'd have to pay every month. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be 8,888 a year, it'd be slightly more than 8,888 divided by 12 every month. Okay, but anyway, these are just, okay, so this is the last of these definitions for today's class. So everybody who's on Wall Street knows what a perpetuity is, and they know how to compute its value at a given interest rate. They know what an annuity is and how to compute its present value. A mortgage is almost the same thing as an annuity, okay? The only twist is that the mortgage is computed monthly instead of annually, but when they using a monthly interest rate, but when they say the monthly interest rate, instead of telling you the monthly interest rate, they tell you the monthly interest rate times 12. Okay, it's just a convention. All right. So those are all the things you have to memorize. Now, what? Let's try to use the way we can think. 
okay, and do some practical problems here. So here's one of my, one of the simplest and most important ones is let's say you're a Yale professor. I gave this example on the very first day of class. You're a Yale professor. When I first gave the example a few years ago when I, when I uh, wrote the notes, the average Yale professor, so this was quite a few years ago, eight or nine years ago, was making 115000 a year. Now, as it happens, the average Yale salary now is 150000 a year. Okay, but anyway, when I wrote it, it was 115000 a year. So let's suppose that you're starting today, this year's professors are making 115000 and let's say your salary uh, will go up, go up at 3% inflation every year. Okay, so, uh, and that's inflation that's equal to the general inflation. So your salary is keeping pace with general inflation and no more. So professors, you know, we're not doing that well. So the salary is 115,000, now it would be 150,000. But anyway, it was 115,000 on average. And let's say you're just going to be kept up with inflation. You know, they're going to be, t you're going to be told every year you have a 3% raise, but that's just going to keep you up with inflation. Now, you know you're going to work for 30 years, let's say, 30 years, and retire for 30 years. A little ambitious about how long you're going to live, but let's just suppose that's what you think. You're going to live for 30 years after that. So how much should you spend every year? Well, you can't answer that. And let's say you want level, level real consumption. So you want to consume the same amount every year for the rest of your life, which is going to be 60 years, 30 at Yale, 30 retired. So how much do you spend every year in, in consumption? OK, well, you can't answer that until you know the interest rate. So let's say the interest rate the nominal interest rate equals, let's say, 5.3% uh, about, a little bit more than 5.3%. OK, so if the nominal interest rate is 5.3%, inflation you know is going to be 3%, and you've got 115,000 coming, going up with inflation every year, how are you ever going to figure out how much to spend starting next year when your job starts? Okay, it looks like a hopeless thing. You'd have to say, well, if I get 115000 next year, I consume some of it, I put the rest in the bank, it makes you know, interest, it grows at 5.3%, but then inflation is 3%, so I take that into account, I figure out how much to spend the year after that, but then I'm going to get 115000 more of that, so I'll save something, maybe more for my next thing, and then I'll deposit that at another 5.3%, and I have to take into account inflation at 3%. Anyway, it sounds like it's going to get very complicated. How are you going to figure this out? But in fact, it's very simple, and Irving Fisher pointed the way to do it, and we can now do it in our heads. Okay, so Fisher said, don't figure out all this year-by-year -year stuff. It's going to be, and don't get mixed up with the rate of inflation. You don't, you don't care about inflation. You're going to look through the inflation and only care about the real consumption. So the fact is, you care about the real rate of interest. So the real rate of interest, 1 plus r equals 1 plus i over the rate of inflation, which equals 1.053 over 1.03 which is about 1.023, right? This is a, we're doing things in our head now, so we have to be a little bit approximating. So, f right, if I divide this by this, these numbers are so close to 1 that I'm basically just subtracting the bottom from the, the denominator from the numerator. If I multiply 1 plus uh, g times 1 plus i, all right, 1 plus g times 1 plus r, that's going to equal 1 plus g plus r plus rg. And if r is very close, you know, is 0.03 and g, r is, you know, if this is 0.02 and this is 0.03, then the multiplication is 0.006. So this is practically irrelevant. So multiplying numbers like this or dividing them is just like adding these things. So it's just like adding, taking this term and subtracting that. Okay, so when you get a number near 1 divided by another number near 1, you just take the difference from 1 in the numerator minus the difference from 1 in the denominator. It's pretty close to doing actually the division. Okay, so this is about 2.3% interest. So the real interest rate is about 2.3%. So Fisher would say, 
aha, use the real rate of interest. You're getting 115,000 real payments every year for 30 years at a real interest rate of 2.3%. But we know what that is. So what is 115,000 of real dollars every year at a real rate of 0.023%? Well, remember what our formula was. It's the cash you're getting every year for perpetuity. You got it every year forever. It would just be the cash you're getting divided by the interest. So 115,000, that's over a tenth of a million, every year forever at 2.3% interest. That would be worth, that's five million so far. But you're not getting it every year. You're getting it in for 30 years. So 1 minus 1.023 to the 30th. OK, so what's that equal to? It's no longer 5 million, because that would be getting the money forever. OK, 1.023 to the 30th is what? OK, so we said that 2.3% interest is 2.3 into 72 is, uh, you know, 2.3 times 30 is 69. So because it's close to zero, the 69 rule almost works. So anyway, an approximation would say 2.3 into 72 is just a little bit over 30. OK, so it doubles every 30 years. And you've got it for 30 years. So it's just going to be 2. This number's about 2, right? 2.3% into 72 is approximately 30. So every 30 years at this interest rate, it doubles. So therefore, you've got 115,000 over 0.023 times 1 minus a half. You've lost half the value by not getting it forever. So that's 2.5 million. So Fisher says, look, remember the budget set. You know, in GE, we studied budget set. We put P1, X1, plus P2, X2 plus p, you know, 60, x60, that's on the left-hand side, is less than or equal to p1 endowment 1 plus p2 endowment 2 plus p30 times endowment 30. OK, you're getting 115,000 of real goods every year for 30 years. p1 is 1 over 1.023. p2 is 1 over 1.023 squared, et cetera. So this revenue on the right is just the annuity of 30 years of 115,000 of real goods. So it's worth 5 million reduced because it's not a perpetuity. It's only an annuity for 30 years. And so it's worth 2.5 million. So we've got the right-hand side. That's this, 2.5 million. Okay, That's how much the present value. So that's what a, a professor at Yale can look forward to his entire her entire career, if she started 10 or 20 years ago, would be, oh, she'll make two and a half million in present value terms. If she'd gone to Wall Street, you know, in five years, if she were a Yale undergraduate, went to Wall Street in five or 10 years, she'd be making more than that every year. So what, uh, <laughs> so well, not everybody, but anyway. So, um, okay, so how much does she spend every single year of her 60 year life? Well. So we have to figure out this number, C, the coupon. right? We have to figure out how much can she spend every year of her life. What C can she spend at 2.3% interest, where now I have a 60 here? OK, so, so it's an annuity of 60 years of constant consumption at this interest rate. So how much is it worth? OK, well, I have to just figure out 1.023 to the 60th. 1.023 to the 30th was a half. 1.023 to the, I mean, was 2. 1.023 to the 60th is 4. So this is 1 fourth. OK, so, so we have 3 quarters here. So this is, you know, C over 0.023 times 3 quarters. That's what we have. So you multiply 4 thirds by 2.5 million, you get 10 million equals 10 million over 3 equals point. So it's uh, point. This is uh, 0 0.023 times 3 divided by 3 times 10 million equals C. 
Okay, and so that's like 76,000 something. Okay, 3 into 0 0.023 is 76, and then you have to figure out you know, what decimal place you're at, and you know it's going to be more, it's going to be less than 115,000. So it's got to be some number that's close, you know, is some reasonable percentage of 115,000. So it works out to 76,000. So that's it. You could do that in your head. I mean, not today, but you know, after looking at it for, you know, by next time you'll be able to do that in your head. So this professor can figure out what you should do. Seems like a hard problem, you know, it's life. You've got to figure out what to do every year, and now you know how to do it very easily. Okay. So, any questions about this? I want to do one more little example. All right. So, let's do a harder example. When I was a, it's easier computationally, but harder conceptually. When I was, just got tenure at Yale, uh, actually I had tenure for a few years, you'll see why this is relevant. Um, the president, Benno Schmidt of Yale, said, a horrible thing has happened. Generations of Yale presidents before me have not realized that the buildings were not getting the proper care. There's deferred maintenance. Generation after generation did no fixing up of the buildings. I'm the first president who's going to act responsibly and fix up the buildings. And, he said, um, I'm going to fix up the buildings. And I can tell you that I've hired these planners and they've come and done an exhaustive study and we have to spend a hundred million a year for 10 years, each year, I said each year, each year for 10 years to fix up the buildings properly. So that plan, by the way, is the thing that got turned into fixing one college a year. So, 100 million for 10 years, that's what we need. These presidents before me have overlooked it. They've spent as if we don't have to keep up the buildings. I recognize the problem. I'm going to correct it. This is a huge expense they didn't take into account. We have to reduce the budget. So how much do you reduce the budget by? How many cuts should he have made in, his first, uh, in that first year? How would you have figured out what to do? Okay, so what he did is he recommended firing 15% of the faculty, which didn't go over very well. And the faculty, it was an amazing thing. How can you, you know, there's no structure at Yale. The president runs Yale. There's no Senate, there's no labor union, there's no nothing. It's just the president. Suppose the president announces, I'm going to get rid of 15% of the faculty. What is the faculty supposed to do? So, I mean, there's no mechanism. So what happened is the old deans, who are no longer deans, they were just old, almost all of them were men again, I guess old guys, they got together and said, well, we have no power, we have no position, but we used to be deans at Yale. It's up to us to do something. We're going to appoint a committee who's going to examine the logic of the president's decision. So we're going to appoint six people that we're going to pick out of the blue and they're going to make a report to the faculty and tell us what to do. So um, I was one of the six and the other five guys were pretty uh, nervous, well we all were nervous about um, actually getting up in front of the president and the provost and the dean and saying that it was all wrong and he shouldn't do this. So, uh, but we had tenure. So we could get up and say whatever the hell we wanted to. Okay, so what did I say? What would you have said if you were me? Okay, now the whole budget was, the whole budget of Yale was one billion equals annual budget. A lot of things you can't cut. So notice a hundred million a year is 10 percent of the annual budget. Okay, so he basically said, well, we've got a, you know, we've got a hundred million a year, we ought to cut out, you know, 10 percent of the budget, and since there's some things we can't get rid of, you know, we got to keep making fixed payments, and the faculty something, you know, of course I'm not going to fire the tenured faculty, I'm going to fire, you know, people who aren't tenured, and when faculty retire, I just won't hire anyone to replace them, that's how I'm going to get rid of the faculty, that's how he got to 15 percent. So what would you, uh, what would you have done? What would you have said if you were me? Don't do it. But what else would you have said? What calculation can you do? So you know now what to say, yet you can't think of what to say. So what would you say? So I'll come to you in a second. What's a reasonable number? How would you think of a reasonable number? Let's take his facts as correct. In fact, they didn't turn out to be that 
far off. I mean, the central, the, 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 the people he hired were pretty good at assessing how much stuff needed to be done. Yes. Yeah, and then what? <laughs> okay, so that's a good start. Uh, he says the first thing he'd do is he'd think about what a 10-year annuity at $100 million a year is worth, okay? So why would he want to do that? So that's good, that's what he should do. That's how I started, but what's the relevance of that? Yep. What if you got that much then now you could still play? Right, so he could. Okay, so he could say, alumni, please do something about, you know, it's a billion dollars, not quite, something less than a billion dollars, we'll figure it out in a minute. So alumni, please hand over, you know, three quarters of a billion dollars and uh, I won't have to fire my faculty. Okay, he could try that. What if the alumni didn't come through? Now you, I know you're going to say something, but I'm going to give a couple more people a chance. Back there, yep. So you would short a, a, a ten-year annuity. Okay, what were you going to say? Uh, well, the significant deposit, so like ten years would probably be the president's three to like minimum, but the faculty would have like six perpetuity based on like the entire time. Yep. So if you calculate um, the, the Q to the I to the professor, it's probably a lot more than the entire annuity, and then see how many of those they take to compensate for the Q and the annuity. Okay, now we're on the right track, exactly. So I'm, I'm gonna go a step further. I went a step further. I said, you know, Yale is forever. So what he's telling us, <laughs> what he's telling us is that we need to catch up to where we should be to make up for all that lost, you know, maintenance. He's not saying, by the way, that the presidents who built, you know, the colleges in the 1920s and stuff weren't paying attention to the physical plant. He was talking about the few generations before him. So once we make up for those losses and then return to a steady state, you know, after spending the, the 100 million a year for 10 years, we'll be back to Yale in a steady state. Yale's gonna go on forever. So the point is, why should the 10 years, why should the next 10 years generation pay for something that's going to, you know, make Yale better for the whole infinite future of Yale? So I said, how much would every generation, not just today, but forever in the future, have to consume less in order to make up for this one-shot problem, this deferred maintenance that a couple generations of Yale presidents uh, didn't put in? So in other words, um, I would figure out the present value of the 10-year, uh, 100 mil annuity, okay? And then I would set that equal to what coupon uh, perpetuity gives you the same present value. Okay, so, all right, so how can you figure that out? So, in other words, if you lose 100 million for 10 years, that's equivalent to how much less for every year. Okay, so uh, it turns out to be quite a big deal. So, it depends on what the interest rate is. So let's say, now, it happens that Yale has an interest rate. Yale always uses this 5% rule. So if you take R equal to 5%, um, that's supposedly the money Yale, after inflation, is confident that it can get on its endowment. Usually it thinks it can get more. You'd figure out what the, what the annuity value is of 100 million. Okay, so I'm over time. So anyway, we're going to have to, so the punchline is it comes to 32 million a year, not 100 million a year. We'll do this calculation next time. And you don't need to fire 15% of the faculty to get 32 million a year. So we'll start next time.